Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Shirali Arvind Rinwal and today we'll be discussing hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Previously, uh, they were called as toxemia of pregnancy or pregnancy-induced hypertension, but now we've agreed to the fact that the term would be hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Now, hypertensive disorders represent the most common medical complication of pregnancy affecting around 7 to 15 percent of all gestations and they account for approximately a quarter of all antenatal admissions. So you understand that there is a widespread prevalence of hypertensive disorders which is incessantly increasing and roughly about 10 percent of pregnancies are affected by HDE and 25 percent of all antenatal admissions are because of hypertensive disorder in pregnancy. According to the World Health Organization's systematic review on maternal mortality worldwide, HDPs remain a leading cause of direct maternal mortality. So, we know that hypertensive disorders account for uh, rough about a um, quarter of admissions and uh, they make the woman morbid and more prone for mortality. That is why we need to read it in depth and understand the pathophysiology, the etiology, the high risk factors, how do we screen such women, what interventions can be put in in order to prevent uh, a woman landing into preeclampsia, what are the management modalities, what is the timing regarding delivery, mode of delivery, some anesthetic mm, modulations, etc, etc. So this is what we are going to deliberate upon in today's lecture, okay. So together with hammerish and infection, Hypertension forms the deadly triad that contributes to morbidity and mortality both during pregnancy as well as childbirth. So hemorrhage, infection and hypertensive disorders, this is deadly triad we need to be aware of and we must do everything uh, in our uh, capability to stop this from happening. Now, how do we define hypertension? So uh, just go back uh, to the days of physiology when measuring BP was the first clinical examination we would ever come across and there was so much of uh, nuances in measuring this blood pressure that even up to the final year in medicine when we take BP or in obstetrics, we need to know each and every fact about measuring um, the blood pressure of a person so that you are accurate with the readings and these fallacies don't come into play. So, the following thresholds used by the NHBPEP, that is National High Blood Pressure Education Program Working Group and the ACOG to define hypertension have been accepted by most of the international organizations. So, we have different classification systems, but NHBPEP classification and NHBPEP guidelines are the ones that we follow and most of the international bodies agree to this threshold. So hypertension in pregnancy is defined as systolic pressure level of 140 mmHg or higher that is equal to more than 140 mmHg and or a diastolic blood pressure of equal to more than 90 mmHg. So uh, it can be an isolated rise in the systolic as well as the diastolic and that also accounts for hypertension in pregnancy. So the cutoff is systolic equal to more than 140 and or diastolic equal to more than 90. Now these measurements have to be confirmed on at least two occasions, four to six hours apart. So if there is a single reading of say 142 by 86 or 144 by 96, then you would not confer her as a woman with hypertension in pregnancy. You have to take another reading four to six hours apart, but the two readings should be spaced within a one week period. Okay. Now, uh, why have I written Korotkov 5? I'll be telling you about the Korotkov sounds, and basically, Korotkov 5 is the absence of the tapping sounds in an oscillatory method, you uh, know, method where we are using the mercury sigma manometer. And here, uh, there is another sound called as the Korotkov 4, which is basically the muffling of the sound. So, we do not take Korotkov 4. Instead, we take complete disappearance of sounds while we are doing this auscultatory uh, method of uh, man measurement of blood pressure in pregnancy. Now, elevation of more than 30 mmHg systolic or more than 15 mmHg diastolic above the patient's baseline has been abandoned from the diagnostic criteria of hypertension as it has not 
proven to be a good prognostic indicator. So previously there was something called as the 3015 rule, which said that despite the ranges are of 140 and 90, you know, the target value or the cutoff is 140 and 90, but even if the systolic rises are more than 30 of the patient's baseline, the diastolic more than 15 of the patient's baseline, then also you should consider it as hypertension pregnancy. But this 3015 rule is no longer applicable and we have strict cutoffs of 140 and 90 in order to diagnose hypertension in pregnancy. Okay. The diastolic blood pressure is determined as a disappearance of the sound. So Korotkov phase 5 and not Korotkov 4. Uh, so Korotkov phase 5 or disappearance as opposed to Korotkov phase 4 or muffling was chosen as it is more reproducible. What do I mean by that? That muffling of the sound is a subjective finding, you know. So, it might be so that I feel that the sounds are muffled at this particular point, but you might not feel the same. Whereas, disappearance is more an objective finding. That is the reason why Korotkov 4 was chosen as compared to Korotkov. Korotkov 5 was chosen as compared to Korotkov 4. And it also showed a better correlation with true diastolic blood pressure in pregnancy. When Korotkov 5 is absent, there can be states where there is a hyperdynamic circulation and these uh, sounds can continue right up to 0 mmHg. There, Korotkov 4 should be accepted because Korotkov 5 is not present. How do you take the blood pressure? So the blood pressure level should be taken with an appropriate sized cuff. Uh, the length should be 1.5 times the circumference of the upper arm. Or a cuff with a bladder that encircles 80% or more of the arm. This is a very specific guideline. Undersized or oversized cuffs are not advocated. Depending on whether your patient is very lean or extremely obese, you need to have cuffs of different sizes available in order to get an accurate reading. The uh, person can be in an upright position like sitting or even um, supine or 45 degree uh, reclined or a left lateral position. Ideal positions would be a left lateral or a 45 degree reclining. The right arm should be supported. The arm in which you are taking the pressure it can be a left arm as well. It should be supported in a horizontal position which must be maintained at the level of the heart. Okay. So the cuff size length 1.5 times the upper arm circumference. A bladder of the cuff that encircles 80% or more of the upper arm. Patient is in an upright or a lateral position, uh, 45 degree reclining. The arm in which the BP is being measured is supported in a horizontal position at the level of the heart and should be measured after a 10 minute or longer rest period. So, supposedly a woman has come to you walking the stairs or walking a long way. So, you ask her to have a relaxation period or a rest of 10 minutes and then only measure the blood pressure in order to eliminate the physiological forces of stress. Okay. And um, it's a very small point, but you need to remember that avoid tea or coffee intake or smoking because they are known to increase the blood pressure recordings. Another fact is that whenever you take um, BP in a sitting position, especially in uh, OPD patients, uh, what happens is that the patients tend to lean forward or cross their legs. This should not happen. The back should be rested on the chair and the legs should be supported on the ground and they should be uncrossed. Okay, so these are the little factors when uh, you need to keep in your mind while measuring the blood pressure. And as I told you, the cuff should encircle uh, over two-thirds of the length of the arm and the larger cuff should be used for obese patients. So you should have cuffs customized for different BMIs and at least a small size cuff, a moderate size cuff and uh, a large size cuff. This is what you need to have in your OPDs as well as inpatient department. Now, when we talk of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, there are certain risk factors. So, there is a specific class of women who are more prone to these hypertensive disorders. And what are they? So, if she is a primary para, if she is at extremes of age, like if she is less than 18 years and it's a teenage pregnancy, or she is more than 35 years, uh, she is uh, an advanced maternal age pregnancy, both of the extremes of the spectrum are at an increased risk of developing preeclampsia and further consequences. Uh, race and ethnicity. So, especially women who belong to a black race or negro race are at a higher risk of developing preeclampsia. So, are Southeast Asian women and Indian women are also at a moderate risk of developing preeclampsia. What about the genetic predispositions? So, yes, um, now new factors and new genetic uh, studies have come up 
to show that yes there is a genetic predisposition so you have to trace the history of preeclampsia in sister siblings also in the mother and you have to trace a pedigree out of it that what is her risk of developing preeclampsia based on her genetic predisposition next molar pregnancy yes so gestational trophoblastic diseases because the more amount of placental tissue there is the more widespread would be the uh, pathophysiology behind preeclampsia and the higher the risk of preeclampsia developing in the woman so molar pregnancy definitely carries a higher risk of preeclampsia and it carries a risk of atypical preeclampsia that means there is an early onset preeclampsia in these women so uh, i'll be telling about preeclampsia i'll be telling about chronic hypertension and we arbitrarily use the cutoff of 20 weeks uh, because you know that the second wave of trophoblastic invasion uh, near about happens at 20 weeks so any hypertension before 20 weeks is ideally considered to be a chronic hypertension whereas that developing after 20 weeks is considered to be preeclampsia per se but what happens in molar pregnancy is that there can be development of preeclampsia before 20 weeks of gestation and that is why we call it as an atypical preeclampsia that sets off before 20 weeks of gestation okay multiple pregnancy yes larger placenta twin gestations triplet gestations higher risk of developing hypertensive disorders obesity again a bmi of more than 30 uh, is a high risk factor for developing pih next comes smoking well, what happens in smoking smoking releases certain metabolites which are responsible for vasoconstriction right and this vasoconstriction happens systemically more so in the placenta right and in the placenta it leads to a state of utroplacental insufficiency um afterwards it causes a lot of uh, defective trophoblastic invasion into the spiral arterioles and it results in pih i should say hdp right anemia again is a high risk factor for preeclampsia malnutrition yes so both extremes of bmi again if a woman is either obese or extremely malnourished she will be at a risk for preeclampsia Diabetes mellitus, especially that with vasculopathy, uh, is again associated with a high risk of preeclampsia. Then ART or assisted reproductive techniques, uh, yes, uh, they are also uh, linked to increased incidences. Uh, it is said that there is a twofold increased risk of preeclampsia uh, with women who are undergoing ART procedures, especially IVF XC, yes, so these women can have increased risk of PIH. And a short period of cohabitation so supposedly a woman is just married to uh, her husband for a period of two to three months and she conceives so a short period of cohabitation where the woman has not had prior exposure of those sperm antigens um, that also is considered uh, something which may make the woman prone to preeclampsia in a pregnancy and an increased inter-pregnancy interval as well. So, supposedly, first pregnancy was um, in, say, 2002, and the next pregnancy came in 2011 or 2012. Then again, uh, this long inter-pregnancy interval of, say, 10 to 12 years uh, tells you that this woman is, has forgotten those sperm antigens and uh, is, again, prone for PIH or preeclampsia in this pregnancy, okay? And this is just a uh, GK question that May 22 has been declared as the World Preeclampsia Day. So, if any of you is interested, May 22 is what um, we know of as the World Preeclampsia 